welcome everybody um, to our digital conference. Um, dear all, it's a great honor for me to introduce our first keynote speaker, Hayo Zeppel, to you. Hayo Zeppel is one of the best known German journalists and author about sport politics and doping in particular. Uh, and he's head of the doping editorial team of German's public broadcasting channel ARD, ARD, and is considered an expert on doping issues in German and international sports. Since 1997, Mr. Zabut reports on sport political issues. By that, he reported, for example, um, on the doping scandal within the Tour de France and above regarding cyclists like Floyd Landers or Jan Ulrich and the Spanish physician Dr. Fuentes. Not at least since then, uh, the documentaries by him and his team have been groundbreaking in un uncovering doping scandals. And here may be the most important one that I like to mention is the doping scandal documentary about Russia in 2014 but also about doping in athletics and cycling or child doping in the GDR. Together with his founded company, eyeopening.media, he represents investigative quality journalism. His investigative documentaries do cover not only doping related issues, but also human rights violations and other integrity issues in international sport. Ayo Zeppel is awarded with the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany for his work on German broadcasting RD. And he's one of the best known and acknowledged journalists on sport in Germany and sport politics in particular. As his experiences and his perspective are another interesting view on our main topic, um, what is doping and integrity of sports in general, I'm really looking forward now to listen to his talk on dependence and doping work, the role of independent control, um, maybe with some digital hands. Thank you that you are here, Hajo Zeppert. Hello, everybody from, from Potsdam, close to Berlin. Um, hopefully you hear my voice and uh, you can now listen to me and to my presentation. Now I'm seeing myself on the screen even better. Um, yes, what can I say? Um, uh, um, I'm Hopefully there's a, voice, there's a noise in the background. Do you hear that? Do you, hear, do you hear the voice in the background? Hopefully not. Can, can you answer, please? It's okay. It's good. Yeah. Sorry for this. Because I have, I have uh, my 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 flat is renovated. Currently is uh, under construction, so uh, it's a little bit noisy. Sorry for this. Uh, again, um, I'm working for. Well, I've been working for German television ARD since uh, 1985. So I'm really, let's say, an old guy in ARD now. I'm almost 60. And I started in 1985 in West Berlin. And in West Berlin, I was a classic, a classic sports reporter covering almost everything uh, from, from swimming to, to, to football to um athletics everything but i was always very interested and curious to learn about the background of high performance sports and not only about the surface and uh, as more I, as uh, i was uh, working on that field i realized that what we see and we watch in television is only one part of the whole story and um and there needs to be much more reporting on what happens behind the scenes in the backyard of sport and um so I started to 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 work on this in the early, uh, early 90s, late 80s, long time ago, as you can see. And um, and my first feeling was at that time that what I was trying to do was not <clears throat> um, appreciated by everybody in sports. There, in particular, there have been people who have been uh, strongly in opposition to the way. Uh, I wanted to um, uh, cover sports. This was this, the initial starting point was um, the bidding from, of Berlin for the 2000 Olympics, which was my first major project. And I realized that what has been uh, claimed in public media, what has been claimed in television and radio uh, was more or less a, a kind of PR propaganda for the Berlin uh, government in order to promote the Berlin um, uh, bid for the 2000 Olympics. There have been a lot of real serious and worrying side um, things, um, corruption, uh, bribery, and um, 
um, pressure on, on opposition groups not to um, um, communicate with IOC, for example. I remember that very well. And uh, when I was talking publicly about the really small chances to get the Olympics to Germany, uh, this was not very welcome by the Berlin government. This was not very um, much appreciated by the bidding committee. And I learned the first time that if you just tell what's obvious, uh, I would say if you just um, talk about the truth uh, um, publicly, then you can um, receive a lot of resistance and a lot of critics because you are not in the mainstream. Um, I realized more and more that sports journalism in particular is a field where we have a lot of promoting people, a lot of uh, supporters, a lot of fans um, uh, climbing over the fans in the, in the arena. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a saying by a very known German uh, fellow colleague, Thomas Kistner from the Deutsche Zeitung, um, because there have been so many people coming from sports, wanted to stay in sports, wanted to become sports journalists or reporters and uh, had turned a blind eye on all what's happening behind the scenes. And the major issue at that time in the early 90s was already doping. For um, what reason? Um, everybody was suspicious about the un unbelievable success of East German athletes uh, and the Russian athletes, Soviet athletes and all the other athletes in the 80s and 70s. But uh, um, uh, due to the, to the Cold War and to um, the, the impossible uh, um, approach um, to investigate in East Germany or in the Soviet Union, it was uh, almost impossible to do an in-depth investigation on doping in that country. But it was very, very obvious that uh, young female athletes have been um, mis uh, abused uh, as guinea pigs for um, the um, East German government and for the sports policies of that country. You know that in that uh, era, um, East Germans and Soviet Union and also USA, of course, they won a lot of medals at the Olympics at World Championships. And everybody could see that there was something uh, suspicious going on. Deep voices, uh, very male. Um, appearance of very young uh, athletes and uh, later on um, people realized that there have been a lot of uh, bad side effects for the young, very young female athletes. This was my first field after the Berlin bit where I was deeply investigating in the early and um, mid 90s. And even then I realized again that what we did, what I did was not appreciated even by my own colleagues because German television, ARD, for example, also ZDF and uh, the same in other European or other countries, they, they um, uh, bought the TV licenses, TV uh, rights for covering big sports events. And in order to achieve um, high ratings from the audience, all bad uh, reporting was not uh, welcome because um, it could lower the ratings. Um, it could make, a, uh, let's say, a product less attractive. So um, even my own colleagues told me I should stop with that kind of reporting or at least I should not um, exaggerate this kind of reporting. So um, I was already working on that field, but it was more or less like an alibi. So I did not really much. I was doing both things at the same time, covering sports. Um, I was a swimming um, live TV commentator for, for ARD from the early 90s until 2006. But at the same time, I did more and more doping investigation. But I was the only one in ARD. And uh, not only me, but also sports officials didn't like what we did. What we did. Uh, so Thomas Bach, for example, uh, was was not one, one of my best friends at that time already, and it became our relationship became, to be honest, even worse when we started to investigate more and more in doping and also in uh, let's say failed anti-doping measures by uh, the sports entities. If it uh, if you talk about the IOC, it's obvious that ARD, ZTF, and many many others um, have 
have covered uh, big, big uh, sports fraud festivals. It's it's, sim not, uh, it's just simply like that, because there have been so much doping going on that you can finally say it's in some sports, if it's athletics, it's swimming, weightlifting, for example, rowing um, in, in Olympics and later on also in Paralympic sports. There was massive fraud and massive doping going on, and it was not only not uncovered and not unveiled, it was also covered up um, uh, by the IOC because everybody knew at that point that um, doping um, in sports to, to, to report on that uh, doesn't help to promote um, the, uh, let's say the public uh, awareness, the public perception of the Olympics. So um, it became worse and worse and uh, the 2000, um, the early 2000s, I was more and more also, um, um, I was also more uh, focusing on cycling. Uh, there have been, has, has been a lot of um, coverage in German television about the Tour de France and uh, ARD, that means my employer at that time was not only covering the Tour de France, they have, were also promoting the German team telecom. Um, there was a big contract between ARD and Team Telecom in order to get um, exclusive interviews with um, Jan Ulrich, the German superstar, at, at in this uh, time, and also to have our our um, uh, brand, the, 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 the one as as a, as a, as a, as, a, as, a, as a number on on the uh, jerseys of the Tour de France um, cyclists. So this was. A, a kind of PR tool for ARD, but it shows very obviously that, um, let's say, the, 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 the borders between independent coverage and PR haven't, haven't existing at all, and haven't existed at all. So um, this was a major issue uh, and in 2006. Um, um, it's became even more complicated because then uh, um, the whole case of Ofemano Fuentes, the, the Spanish doctor, was, was on the table and uh, uh, later it could be revealed in, in summer 2006, it was uh, at the start of the FIFA World Cup in Germany, that uh, Jan Ulrich, the German superhero, was one of the clients of Fuentes. So ARD uh, was struggling uh, with uh, different interests. Uh, the fir uh, first hand, they wanted to cover um, Tour de France. They wanted to get high ratings. On the other side, as a public uh, um, financed TV um, networks, they, uh, they, it was their obligation to also report about the doping stuff. But there was nobody except me who was doing that. I was the only one. And uh, they didn't want me to continue on that. On the other hand, they had no choice. So um, this was a um, conflict of interest, an obvious conflict of interest. And finally, they gave up and asked me to, to travel to, to Spain in 2006 and to do the whole coverage of Fuentes. And this was a breakthrough, not only for, for us or not only for me, but in, in particular for um, German television. Because the first time in German television, the first time in sports uh, coverage, um, we reported uh, really intensively and really in depth uh, about doping and corruption in sport. And it was not only um, my work, to be honest, it was more or less only that I was benefiting from the enormous investigation by Spanish colleagues at the time. So the whole documents, the whole protocols of Fuentes haven't been published in German media on a large scale, but in Spain, in Spain it happened. So it was very easy for me just to, to ask my Spanish colleagues who have uh, um, covered that already, if they could uh, provide all the information um, and uh, uh, I asked them if I can use this information and they had no problems with that. So I was able to get all the documents and I published them the first time in German television. And this 
was a turning point, I think, the first turning point uh, in the perception of uh, pro cycling and doping, because there was so much evidence, so much proof, uh, people could not ignore that anymore. And um, so people realized that this kind of coverage is also very, very important for a public uh, um, television uh, network. Um, so um, they learned their lessons, I would say, and um, uh, more and more discussions began to arise. And at the very end of, 2000, uh, of this whole development in 2006, early 2007, uh, ARD decided to build uh, an ed editorial team, ARD doping editorial team. This was early 2007, and this is still until today, the group of people I'm working with. Um, and um, this was, um, let's say it was a dialectic uh, development because there was so much pressure at the very end. So they have been forced to, to do something and they created that department. And this department <clears throat> achieved so many in the, in the upcoming years. Um, and as already mentioned it, if you talk about Russia only, but if you talk other other human rights issues in sports, so we have been able, uh, starting in two thousand seven, to work on corruption and doping matters independently and exclusively. So we have been funded, let's say, um, at the bottom line by the public, because um, uh, as you might know, in Germany we, ha Germany we have a system, it's, it's, it's a public fee, you have to pay every month for uh, television and radio, for public television and radio, and the very, 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 very small amount uh, or percentage of that money goes into the coverage of sports, politics and uh, background stories in sports and um, critical uh, stories. And uh, I am one of the people uh, working in the, on that field. So um, I told my RD colleagues in 2007, I'm only uh, available for that department. I'm only ready to work for, for this group of people and uh, for my bosses, if they allow me to work completely and 100% independently. I don't want to have any influence. Nobody can tell me what I'm doing uh, in terms of which sports I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on or which athletes. If I have evidence, we, we will report it. And this is a precondition. If anybody comes to me and tell me, no, we can't do that because we have TV rights, we have TV licenses, we have to take care of our stakeholders, I would have said, okay, I'm out and I won't continue on that. But I have to say that very clearly here, it never happened since 2007. Does anybody came to me and told me I'm not allowed to do that. It never happened. And this was a precondition for all the independent coverage we did starting in 2007. We did documentaries about the German National Anti-Doping Agency. Um, at the very end, they increased their number of employees from seven to 23 because of our coverage, because everybody realized that this small group of anti-doping fighters is not able to um, um, to cover the whole field of work which has to, had to be done at that point. So our coverage helped them a lot. We did a, a big documentary of doping in China in 2008, uh, which uh, led finally to, um, to uh, very harsh reactions by the Chinese government, um, um, focus on our investigations. I didn't like it at all, as, as you can imagine. And um, we started uh, investigations in, in Belarus, in Kenya, all the Kenyan stuff we are currently talking about is finally based or um, originally based on our coverage in 2012, uh, when we did the first uh, TV stories about Kenya and nobody believed uh, that there was doping widespread going on and everybody blamed us for um, trying to, to um, destroy sports and just culture in Kenya. And later they realized that uh, the, the problem is even bigger than we expected in 2007, uh, 2012. And, um, and now, as you know, uh, we have a lot of, lot of doping cases still nowadays. 
based on the um, um, social and very complicated situation in that country and also on the failed anti-doping efforts of many entities for years in, in, in Kenya. Um, and also we did, we did uh, the coverage of um, the Russian doping scandal and it started in, in 2013 at the very end. Maybe you are interested to get a little insight on, into that. Um, it was, uh, as in many cases in journalism, it was more or less, um, let's say, a coincidence because uh, in 2010, that means three years before, uh, a scientist from, from Austria approached me and told me that there was a conference in, I think, in Vienna where a Russian scientist from the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow had a presentation and uh, talked about um, an anabolic substance which he had created and he called it the wonder drug, which might help to increase the muscle um, 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 uh, development in a very short period of time without any training. Uh, very interesting uh, and not very believable, I would say, but anyway. And he promoted that, that substance and told the people it's not only good for, uh, for the use in medical um, 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 or the clinical um, um, surroundings, but also uh, in doping. And everybody's invited to, to, to use that and maybe to ask so even their own wife to, to, to take it because the hormonal effect is, un un is unbelievable. So people could not believe what the Russian scientist said at the conference. And the Austrian guy was furious and contacted me and told me I should investigate that guy from Moscow. But uh, like always in my in my profession, uh, you do that. You try you find try to find evidence, uh, and then you have other topics you have to follow up, and you forget it. So to be honest, I forgot it. But in 2013, prior to the Olympics in Sochi, I realized that this story was not told uh, uh, so far. And uh, again, I, I started my investigation into that uh, Russian scientist in uh, December 2013. And thought, how can I prove? How can I prove that this guy is, is abusing his own um, scientific work, paid by the Russian um, um, government or by at least by the Moscow government uh, for the abuse of uh, substances in sport? And I wanted a proof set. So I thought the best thing is I will travel to Moscow. I will pretend to be a German manager for a German Olympic team. And I would ask him if he would be ready to, to sell me his so-called wonder drug uh, in order to, to prepare my athletes for the Sochi Olympics. So I went to Moscow undercover, met him in a, in, a, in, a, in a bar in Moscow. And this guy was so much keen on money and so much interested in, um, to get um, his substance sold. Uh, he didn't care about who take who potentially would take the drug. He said, it's, uh, you can do what you want. And he wanted to get $100,000 for that drug. So I, I got a small sample in order to check if that is really the, the substance he was talking about. I brought it to a laboratory in Germany and they proved and confirmed that this substance is really new, is not easily detectable and has a highly, highly, highly performance enhancing uh, impact. So this was a story, and we could expose this Russian scientist in German television prior to the Sochi Olympics. And this finally led to a big attention globally about doping in Russia. And uh, finally, um, I got a call from an informant from the World Anti-Doping Agency, the former chief investigator, Jack Robertson, and he told me, ah, how you, you have done um, um, yeah, good work on, on Russia. Are you interested to get in touch with Russian whistleblowers? I can tell you 10 times more uh, 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 apart from that, what you have already done. Uh, are you interested? So I said, yes, of course, I'm a journalist. So I'm always interested to talk to whistleblowers or to talk to people who can deliver or provide documents. So I met Vitaly and Yulia Stepanov and you might remember these names. These are the famous Russian whistleblowers who helped to uncover the whole truth about the Russian anti-doping system. 
they have been the main protagonist of my documentary in 2014. Uh, they provided um, hidden recordings, video and audio documents. They talked on camera. They left the country. I had to help them to leave the country, but it was too dangerous for them. And so we could expose the story of the Russian doping system in 2014 in December, which has been the initial starting point for all what happened uh, afterwards in the aftermath of that documentary, as you know, about um, the, the, the Russian ban, all the uh, polit sports political discussions between WADA and IOC, um, exclusion from the Olympics, a uh, lot of doping cases, uh, another fraud by the Russians, uh, the, the escape of Grigory Ravchenkov to 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 so to United States, uh, Grigory Rochenkov, the former lab director of Moscow. Later on, a big documentary Icarus was done by a um, by a, a U.S. American director Brian Fogel, which won the the um, uh, the Oscar. Um, uh, so it was a really really a big big thing uh, um, after our first. Um, story in 2014 and as you know until uh, exactly this week it's still lasting the scandal and um, um, on the 7th and 16th that means in two days the so-called WADA sanction expires uh, potentially potentially not we don't know what what will happen afterwards and this sanction is also based on the first investigation in 2014. So uh, this can can done by by, by investigative sports journalism. And now I am at the very end of my little presentation. Uh, I didn't talk about too much on the Paralympics because I'm not an expert in Paralympics. Um, it's only sometimes uh, on my focus when I'm talking about um, uh, doping in general, uh, particularly when it comes to the Russian doping scandal. But why this kind of coverage is so important for sports and is not on is not dis, uh, destroying sports but is helping um, sports from my point of view to save the cultural good the cultural value of sports because sports officials in particular those on the international level have in many cases not a real interest to unveil those kind of stories or to combat doping in an efficient way for what reason it's to be honest very simple and very easy we have doping going on for decades, for many, many years on the international and on national levels every, everywhere. And it's still ongoing uh, because it's, it, has a, it has an impact. It's, it's very simple. If you talk anabolic steroids, if you take EPO, it helps you to increase your uh, performance on a certain scale, not that much. It is only a very small percentage, but this small percentage helps to win a race or to become Olympic champion, because uh, it's only a very uh, short, uh, very small part of a second. It's only uh, centimeters, whatever it is. But these uh, um, few centimeters, these few parts of a second help to become first. Or if you don't get it, you are only on the tenth place or tenth uh, rank, or you don't you get don't get it on the podium. And this. Is a difference between getting high high sponsor contracts to earn prize monies to uh, become famous um, to come another big sponsor contract uh, to get another big con sponsor contract so uh, there is a lot a lot of um, impact if you have a little or if you improve a little better than the others and this is also due to doping it, it, it's as simple as that so so if we have that. And if you talk about very successful sports competitions, if you talk about sports officials who, um, who always promote sports and, and who don't want to talk about doping, it's very simple. Not doping destroys the, the surface, the, the shining surface of sports. The talk about doping is the main worrying factor, factor for them. So the doping helped to make sports performance is better. And if you don't see the side effects, if nobody talks about it, it helps everybody. It helps the athlete in order to gain, to, to win the gold medal, to get 
more sponsorship contracts, to get higher price monies, to get other contracts, to uh, be able to feed his family, um, and to have a good life, to be, to be honest, and to, to regain everything what you have invested for 10, 15, 20 years of training, hard endurance training, hard power training, every day, eight or 10 hours, you get it in a kind of, of reimbursement for what you have what, what, what you have done for so many years. So it's a benefit for the athlete. It's a benefit for his agent because he gets um, um, in many cases, let's say 10, 15 or 20%, uh, a, a certain percentage of the price money of the sponsorship contracts. That means he has also a very good benefit. If an athlete is not detected as a doper and if he's successful, not only the agent, also the um, organizer of a big event, because the event is, is much more interesting for the audience, more spectators in the stadium, a higher TV audience. You can sell your advertisement in the stadium for higher prices. Um, you can sell the TV rights for higher prices to the TV networks. So it's good for the organizer if you have good performances and nobody talks about doping. And if doping helps to improve the performances, more people want to watch the competition. The next thing is a TV network, the same thing. You have higher TV ratings if the sport is popular, if, if a sportsman is, is successful, uh, if, the, if the event itself is attractive. So you can, you can uh, sell your uh, commercials within the coverage of, a, of a TV coverage uh, um, for higher prices. So you have also a benefit. So the sponsors, they, they pay more money for there's a presentation in the stadium or in television, and they can sell their products um, on a higher level, better, good for them. The governments, they can uh, argue that their funding in sports is obviously very effective, good for them. Politicians can say that sports is a very, very um, important tool for, for the nation or the international reputation of a country. Everybody has a benefit as long as you don't talk about doping. So there's a small number of people, and it's uh, fortunately it's an increasing number, but it's still a, a small number who would want to challenge the system. There have been state prosecutors because of the big scandals, Fuentes, Festina, the Russian scandal, and so on. And there are some investigative reporters worldwide, not many. Uh, one of them is ARD, who is telling a different story on sports and helps to make the, the, the picture of sports a little broader, more comprehensive, and not only showing the surface, but also what's happening, as I said, in the backyard of sports. So this helped, at least in Germany, that people get a different perspective on sports and are more critical if it comes to corruption, if it comes to doping, if it comes, for example, to Olympic speed, if it comes to um, the perspective of big sports organizations like IOC and FIFA. This is, in many cases, based on the media coverage and the critical media coverage in the last years. And now I tell you what would happen, and it happened already in some cases, if that doping gets unveiled. Only uh, a situation for an athlete where he can lose and not only him. If doping gut gets unveiled, if he gets um, um, caught, the athlete loses his gold medal, he loses his prize money, he loses his sponsor contracts. His agent, he loses all his percentages, all his benefits based on that agreements with the athlete. The organizers have a less attractive event. Maybe this will not be shown anymore on television. Less spectators in the stadium, less advertisement, less money from the sponsors, uh, and so on and so on. The TV uh, networks, they, uh, their ratings go down. They cannot sell their uh, commercials to a higher price. We, we see that now at the FIFA World Cup in Germany. It's a very good example of that. So the ratings are very low compared to other events, and that doesn't help to sell TV commercial windows. Um, we have the sponsors. 
they go they don't want to be connected with doping at least with a talk about doping so they end their, their, their sponsorship contracts or they cannot sell their products uh, anymore because uh, they have no not enough uh, airing time in television and so on and so on the funding of the of the governments is is, is now under scrutiny because people think we cannot um, we cannot support doping sports in sports so the funding it gets lower and so on and so on so everybody loses that means if you don't talk about doping it's a win-win situation for sports officials and all their environment if doping gets unveiled it's a loose loose situation for everybody so give me an answer which really substantial interest can a doping organization have to really fight doping in an efficient and credible way they have a clear conflict of interest and so again and that is the end of my presentation we only that don't need only a kind of uh, control um, or surveillance of sports by media or by critical sports journalists. We need an independent control of sports. And this independence is still not existing in a sufficient way. I can't give you a real uh, good answer how we can solve the problem. I can just tell you that this problem is still existing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heidi Seppelt, for this very interesting view from a completely different perspective into our research or practical field that we deal with every day. Um, we still have some minutes for questions, and maybe there are some from the crowd. Um, you can either tip them in, uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand digitally, then, you, um, uh, then I will take you and you can open your microphone. <clears throat> Actually, I, I will start as soon as the others um, are thinking about their questions. You, you I, I totally agree that we need an independent control system. Um, we see that the one or the other sport federation, for instance, um, track and field with the athletics and integrity unit have started or tried to start to build up such an integrity unit. Um, do you think that this can be a successful approach in order to, um, to fight against the doping within the federation and within the sport itself? I think athletics learned its lesson in the best way compared to others. They have been in the focus, they have been under fire in the, uh, in the beginning of the Russian doping scandal because it was pretty clear that even the International Athletics Federation at that time, so called IAAF, was deeply um, part of that uh, cover, uh, doping system and um, doping cover-up system led by the president itself, Lamine Diak from Senegal at that time. So um, there, was a, there, there was needed a real culture change within athletics. And at least, at least in my, uh, from my understanding and what I was uh, um, seeing there, they did it in a much better way than many, many other uh, federations. So they installed a new president, Sebastian Coe. They um, installed the Athletics Integrity Unit and, and gave them a lot of, let's say, independence, even if they are under the umbrella of the uh, World Athletics, former IAAF. They have a real, uh, quite clear, independent uh, approach. And I know some of these guys, so I, um, I think is it, it's true, yeah, uh, much, much better than, than the years before. So this is a good uh, example, maybe even a role model, which has been copied in the meantime also by other uh, federations like the International Biathlon Union. So I would say yes, in the current situation, they are the front runners, but you can see it very clearly. If you get under scrutiny, if you have a real problem, and if you uh, have a, such a big problem which is uh, publicly discussed and so the pressure is increasing, then federations react. If they finally see that the advantage of fighting against doping is bigger than the disadvantage, then they learn the lesson. That happened to athletics, that happened also to cycling to a certain degree, and that happened also to biathlon, for example. It didn't happen at all, as you know, for example, in weightlifting. 
we did a story about weightlifting and a deep and unbelievable cover-up of, of, of doping and the corruption within the International Federation started by the president himself, Tamash Ayan. This was a negative example. What can happen if there is not at all any control from the outside or even from some parts of the inside? And if many people very closely connected to the president are met more or less a collaborators of the president and of the whole way how they dealt with that with that, with that problem so i would say um yes athletics is a role model um i'm not uh, sure if that is the very end uh, of of the chain which we can what we have to achieve but what i can say at least this seems to be a relatively good starting point thank you are there other questions from the crowd Yeah, Katarina Pucker. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting talk and uh, the research and the investigations you've done so far. I think they have great impact on the public perception nationally and internationally. Um, my question focuses on the public perception of doping. Would you say the public is ready to take a deeper look in the insights of sports and face sports maybe without records and without medical or doping aids? I would give you an example from another field in the society. And what I'm now saying is a little bit conf confrontative maybe, but I say it, uh, frankly, I'm not interested in if there is a majority interested in what I'm doing or what I'm not doing. I don't care. And I tell you for, for what reason. We have many fields in, in, in the society where you have just a minority who is interested. If you talk about culture, if you talk opera, if you talk about painting, whatever, there's a small number of people who have an interest in that. So to be honest, the great majority of people are not interested. They want to watch football, they want to watch whatever, um, um, they don't care. They have their own problems in their lives. Why should I care about that they are not interested in that? What we need is an influential and maybe not too small, but a relatively uh, impressive group of people who are interested in that, what we are doing. That helps, that helps to change the situation. I give you one example in German um, uh, radio, we have uh, uh, different stations, cultural stations, uh, classical music, they have a percentage of ratings, maybe 1.5%, 2%. Would you ever say that we have to finish that because it's, it's, it's only a small, minor, small minority? We would never do that. But in sports, it's always we need to achieve big audiences. We need to uh, reach uh, many people. I say yes, if, if you talk about live sports, yes, because we pay for TV licenses. We, take, we pay for TV rights. So there needs to be a kind of reimbursement. But if you talk about journalism, if you would start with okay, if we don't reach the people, we, we, we leave it, we don't do that, then we would be lost from the very beginning. So I know that we will not reach so many people, but we have reached much more people than we expected years ago. So I would say the public picture of sports, at least in Germany, has changed and has changed also based on our reporting. And that is a big um achievement, I would say, for ARD. This helps to also, uh, you know that in Germany, we have a big discussion of about the public value of public television, and if it's, it's correct or not correct to pay monthly fees for that or not. I think this is a very, very good example why it is so important to have public, not commercialized television, radio reporting in Germany and hopefully in many other countries. I would ask a last question in order to make the um, uh, the shift to the next speaker in 10 minutes um, and maybe a short um, uh, answer by you. Um, the, what we aimed in this project was amplifying the voice of clean athletes. And my question would be, do you see a potential in those athletes who are definitely clean that they that they ask more for for their for their rights to have a fair competition, that they play a more important role within the fight against doping in general? 
would say yes, but since I am a critical journalist, I would ask you the question, why do you know who is clean and who is not clean? Yeah, we, we hope we can say that <laughs> um, based on our research, but, um, but this will maybe yeah. be the yeah. critical point, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the very end, I think what we need is an independent critical voice of athletes uh, apart from sports organizations. Uh, that's what we need. And it, 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 it started, and maybe it started also because of the Russian doping scandal that people woke up and said, we cannot continue in this way. I don't want that Thomas Bach is speaking on behalf of me. I want to talk as an athlete on myself. I want to deal with all the challenges within sports. For example, with the Rule 50, how uh, can I do any advertisement during the Olympics or not? What's, what's about my investment in sports? What's, what, what's about what I'm getting back from sports for what, what I'm doing? I'm more or less the vehicle for the Olympics because without me, Olympics would not work. But if it doesn't work without me, why? I have no real big piece of the cake for myself as an athlete these questions have to be raised and more and more athletes globally at least in some countries let's talk about north america scandinavia uh, central europe are asking those questions and they are want to um, create groups independent athletes organizations fighting against corruption fighting against in, in, in transparency in sports they are like unions for me in a way and to be honest i i'm strongly support this idea as a, as a citizen not as, as a journalist i'm independent but if you ask me personally i would say yes if you talk about democracy in sports we need independent the democratic structures in sports apart from organizations like Thomas Bach's IOC, because this is not an, this is not democracy, not at all. This is monopoly. Monopoly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this really thoughtful insight in, in our work. And I think we will have time for discussions later on again on that. Um, once again, um, thanks and the digital applause to Ayo Zeppel. Thanks for being here. And, and for giving us this first insight. We will have a break until 1.10.